life. Here on Earth, we find it in even the most inhospitable places. But is it out there? Humanity's best chance for an answer this decade may lie buried in the rocks of our red neighbor. NASA's new $2.5 billion robot rover called Curiosity could bring us closer to understanding whether Mars is, or was ever, capable of supporting life. It's the largest and most scientifically equipped lander ever sent to another planet. The science is really the driver of this mission. I think, you know, when some of us think back on first-of-a-kind missions, just getting there is the big thing. And I would say to a certain extent we've already done that on Mars. You know, just getting there is not enough. For us, we need to do more than that. And we brought an enormous scientific payload to really explore the surface of Mars and explore the habitability of Mars. The one-ton Mars Science Laboratory and its Curiosity rover are due to touch down in the Gale Crater, a spot that may record billions of years of Martian history and perhaps its more habitable past. Gale Crater is a, it's a really cool thing. Um, previous missions, when they've landed, taken their first picture, you see generally a, a broad, flat plain with some rocks and a couple little things. Uh, at Gale Crater, we're going to land, depending which direction we're looking. If we're looking to the north, you're going to see a four kilometer tall crater rim that's eroded. If we're looking to the south, you're going to see a six kilometer tall mound, Mount Sharp, in the middle of Gale Crater. That's about the height of Mount Rainier, so it's a very large feature. Uh, and we're landing between those two. Uh, Gale Crater is about 180 kilometers around. Mount Sharp is in the center of that crater. And we're landing between the two, uh, almost a moat around Mount Sharp inside the crater, if you can imagine that. NASA scientists believe Gale Crater contains evidence of water, as well as rock layers that show how the Martian environment has changed with age. We have a landing site in Gale Crater, which we believe by studying it from orbital images has uh, basically contains a record of the first, you know, billion or two years of Mars history, hopefully, expressed in these different rock layers. And we think we've narrowed down the time era where it was most likely to be a planet that could support life, uh, which is the early part of Mars when there's a lot more water around the surface. Back in 2005, Gale Crater was a candidate landing site, and it got ruled out because we didn't have solid enough evidence of good science. So it was actually thrown off the table. And then the MRO spacecraft got to Mars, and they, they had some focused images taken of Gale Crater. And that's when they saw these mineral deposits and realized this is the scientific gold mine that we thought it was, and now we have proof. And so there were some advocates that actually got Gale Crater put back on the table and became one of our final four candidate sites, and then ultimately got selected. We know Gale Crater more thoroughly than any place we've landed in the past. Uh, but that still might be not a very high standard compared to anything you'd study on Earth. You know, so we could still be wrong. Our hypothesis is that water was intimately involved in forming the mineralogy. If it turns out it's not, that'd be a disappointment. Uh, but we actually have quite a bit of evidence to reassure us that water was there. The Gale Crater is about the size of Manhattan, but previous missions have lacked the precision to land in such a limited area. For Viking, it was a couple hundred kilometers long. For MER, it was about 200 kilometers long. For Phoenix, it was about 160 kilometers long. We're 20 kilometers long. Once Curiosity lands on the surface, scientists and engineers will start living on Mars time, with their days lasting 24 hours and 40 minutes. While the rover's sleeping, we kind of plan what it's going to do the next day. We build the new sequence of commands and then we uplink it so that when the rover wakes up in the morning, here's its list of commands of what it's going to do. Uh, and then we go to bed and sleep during the Mars daytime. So since the Mars day is 40 minutes longer than the Earth day, you know, I show up at 9 a.m. one day, I got to show up at 9.40 the next day and 10.20 the next day, and pretty soon you're coming to work at 1.30 in the morning. It's moving. It's not just working the night shift. And so, you know, sometimes you're at night and then a few weeks later you're work back on the day shift. Um, but, you know, in addition, the rest of the world out there is, is, is not on that shift, you know, so sometimes, you know, 
folks have family or friends responsibility you know they've people on the team that are working Mars time you know their children are still going to the soccer game on, on Earth time the first days will be spent determining the rover's position and verifying that it has arrived in good condition. When we land on Mars, we do a few kind of engineering checkouts just to make sure the rover is okay. But kind of around Sol 30, we're going to hit the road and they're going to tell us to make it over to Mount Sharp, wherever That's the good different. science is. It could take weeks before Curiosity begins its journey across the Martian landscape to a place called Mount Sharp, which contains sediments that record Mars' past. The mineralogy that we can sense from orbit that's in these layers has uh, actually varies from the base of the mountain upwards. And it varies in a way that seems to be similar to the global story of Mars that's being put together from the mineralogy, where clay forming minerals that, that require a lot of uh, a long presence of kind of fresh neutral pH water uh, with basic Mars rocks, those clay minerals are found in the bottom of the layers of, the, of Mount Sharp. As we climb up, we see more of the sulfate salts and other minerals that seem to be present on places of Mars that date from its kind of early middle history when maybe the water was being lost and you were leaving a lot of salts behind through evaporation. Uh, so we have this hypothesis that Mount Sharp has captured these different transitions that mark the change from the early wet Mars towards the drier Mars. And by climbing this mountain and sampling these layers, uh, we can not only piece together this history, uh, but determine whether any of those periods represent a habitable environment. In the so-called Mars Yard at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, a replica rover is being used to test the software and the commands used on board the rover. About uh, 30, 40 minutes ago, I sent it a command to go 10 meters straight ahead and 3 meters to the right. That was the goal position. But I didn't give it any other instruction. And what it's doing is it's using its cameras along the way to image the ground and see what the terrain looks like. But Curiosity is definitely more the tortoise than the hare. It can travel at only one-tenth of a mile per hour, so the five to ten mile journey to the mountain will take months. Its onboard software will guide it around obstacles autonomously. The reason we can't just remote control it with a joystick or an app is that Mars is so far away that it takes uh, anywhere from 8 to 42 minutes for the signal to go there and come back. And its unique capability to take soil and rock samples will tell scientists the composition of the various sediments it encounters as it climbs the mountain. Just the ability to acquire these solid samples and feed them to these laboratories is what sets uh, Curiosity apart from any previous rover. The thing that we haven't not done before is drill and really do this very complicated sampling system. Here, you know, we're trying to actually drill into this rock. Uh, I think the Apollo astronauts were the last time we drilled and that was not robotically and it was much closer by. The probe's other instruments include weather and environmental sensors, sensors to determine radiation levels on the Mars surface, and a laser that can vaporize small fragments of rock. That will enable scientists to analyze the gas to determine the chemical components. These tools may help determine whether Mars once had an environment capable of sustaining life. Overall question is to figure out if this landing site where we're going, uh, and by extension Mars, ever was a habitable planet. We're going to a site trying to look for a place that uh, may hold evidence of life from three billion years ago. And the realization from studying life on Earth that life three billion years ago, a lot of it, the evidence is just gone. It's vanished. So where on Mars can you look that you have this chance that something has been sitting there and it's still in a relatively pristine state, you know, for three billion years? It's a long time. So, you know, again, with Curiosity, we're sort of one step before that. We, we take the more, more of the approach of Let's really understand Mars as a planet. It's the context for life. You know, how did the environment change from maybe being friendly to less friendly to life? If we can find that there was this magical time when the conditions were right, uh, as good as they were on Earth when life took hold on Earth, for example, that would be a fundamental improvement to our understanding of Mars. It's looking towards telling future missions, you know, where to go to do that uh, actual life detection experiment. At the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, I'm Robert Lee Holtz for the Wall Street Journal.